On this episode of China Uncensored, Shanghai is going into lockdown. China harasses the Philippines, and Keanu Reeves is banned. And more on this week's China News Headlines. Welcome to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. In our top story this week, China is taking over the world, and we're arguing about Will Smith slapping Chris Rock. In clearly less important news, the Chinese Communist Party is executing its largest lockdown since the original CCP virus outbreak in Wuhan. Shanghai, a city of 25 million people, is going under its first lockdown. No. Remember our first lockdown? I hope they enjoyed it as much as we did. I can't wait to find out what they think of Tiger King. Although, having enough binge-worthy shows is the least of their worries. All infected individuals, even those with mild or no symptoms, are being put into isolation facilities. Yes, China is sticking to its zero-COVID policy, no matter the cost. Because according to state-run Xinhua News, Xi Jinping is personally behind the zero-COVID strategy. And that means China's authorities just can't accept reality. Kind of like guys that still have a mullet. It'll be cool again any day now, just you see. And get this, the Shanghai lockdown is actually the Chinese Communist Party easing up. Instead of locking down the entire city outright, it's being divided into two stages. Shanghai is bisected by the Huangpu River. All residents east of it are locked in their homes from March 28th to April 1st. The next stage will have all residents west of the river under lockdown from April 1st to April 5th. During the lockdowns, Shanghai health workers will also complete two rounds of mass testing. Now, that's what the party says, but the truth is pretty different. Many parts of the city have already been locked down for several weeks. And if cases are found, which is very likely, those areas will continue to be locked down for a lot longer. For example, one asymptomatic case can get an entire apartment complex locked down. Now imagine that across a city with 25 million people. This is a disaster. Most countries have accepted that we need to live with COVID as it becomes endemic. Not China, though. The problem is China can't back down from its zero COVID policy. They've both politicized and moralized it. They've denigrated and demonized places which have switched to living with COVID back in 2021. They can't openly say that we are now switching to living with COVID even though that is what their public health advisors and epidemiologists think they eventually have to do. Kind of ironic, demonizing places that are learning to live with the virus they unleashed on the world with their cover-up. The rest of the world has moved on, China. Don't you think it's time you do too? One of the problems is that China's hospitals are overwhelmed. They're required to treat people with even mild cases of COVID, even people not showing any symptoms. And that means they have less resources to treat people with more serious conditions. One Shanghai resident took to Chinese social media to complain that his father couldn't get his dialysis treatments and could die. That's shocking. Mostly that someone in China was able to get away with criticizing China on Chinese social media. Last week, there was a high-profile case of a nurse who suffered an asthma attack at home and was unable to obtain care at the Shanghai hospital where she worked because the emergency department was closed for disinfection. She died. One Chinese netizen wrote on Weibo, China's version of Twitter, that it seems that as long as people don't die from COVID, it doesn't matter how they die. Sounds like the Chinese government will be more angry at you if you spray a crowd with a sneeze than with bullets. At least those people didn't die from COVID. And then there's concerns about food. Previous lockdowns in other cities left people starving. So when the Shanghai lockdowns were announced, panic buying emptied shelves throughout the city, including toilet paper. Wow, it really is like watching ourselves from two years ago. Grocery shopping has to be done online, but things sell out. One resident told NBC News that he set his alarm for 6 a.m. each morning so he can order vegetables online, but the system becomes overwhelmed with orders and stock runs out within minutes. I basically can't buy vegetables now. Which sounds upsetting. I can't really relate, though, since I haven't eaten a vegetable since the Bush administration. Bush Sr., that is. 
Scurvy isn't a disease, it's a lifestyle. Zero COVID is becoming a lifestyle too, as China's officials use authoritarian means to keep people in line. On March 23rd, Shanghai police detained two men for spreading rumors about a potential full-scale lockdown. Yeah, what a disgusting rumor. There was never a full-scale lockdown. The lockdown was in two stages. And then there's the larger economic impact of the lockdowns. Shanghai accounts for roughly 4% of China's total economic output and is home to the country's largest port and the regional headquarters of hundreds of multinational companies. According to a Hong Kong economist, China is blowing $46 billion a month on its zero-COVID fiasco. Xi's lockdown will probably cost the nation roughly 3.1% of GDP in lost output. And that's optimistic. Pessimistic is, the world economy is going to collapse because of this madman. Start hoarding toilet paper now. Buy, buy, buy. If other Chinese cities like Beijing, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen also go into lockdown, the consequences could be dire. According to the Wall Street Journal, the economic toll is only starting to come into view. Factories, including factories for American companies like Tesla, have been shut down. Hundreds of restaurants, retailers, and other service sector businesses have also been shut down. And yet, the Carl's Jr. in Shanghai is still open. There's no justice in this world. A bigger threat to industry and trade looms if anti-disease restrictions disrupt activity at the Shanghai port. It handles the equivalent of 140,000 cargo containers a day. In other words, the supply chain issues we've been having could get way worse. That's one reason the lockdown is being done in two stages. Shanghai plays such a large role in the global economy that they can't completely shut down in one go. The Chinese regime is desperately trying to limit the economic fallout of the Shanghai shutdown. Just, you know, not desperately enough to stop the ill-advised lockdowns. According to one member of Shanghai's pandemic task force, we can't lock the city down. Our city plays an important role in the national economic and social development and even affects the global economy. More than 20,000 financial services staff were forced back to their offices ahead of Monday's lockdown. Turns out they get to spend it at work, working. Several companies prepared sleeping bags and basic supplies for overnight stays. Yay, work slumber party. Let's gossip about boys and how the government is treating us like slaves. Fun. I just hope the Shanghai government doesn't do what another Chinese city did before lockdowns. Send out a notice saying pets of COVID patients should be killed. Why do they keep doing that? The worst part about being forced to flush your goldfish down the toilet is the fact that you can't find any toilet paper to wrap them up in. The good news is there's been a big public backlash inside China against all this pet killing. And as a result of the huge backlash, that Chinese city has stopped their pet killing plan. The bad news is, you might not want to be one of the people speaking out against a government that enjoys slaughtering things. And coming up after the break, the Philippines is preparing for conflict with China. Welcome back. China continues to harass the Philippines over disputed territory in the South China Sea. The Philippine Maritime Patrol was operating around the Scarborough Shoal, territory claimed by both China and the Philippines. They're both wrong. I planted my flag there so it belongs to me. Respect my authority. But during the patrol, a Chinese Coast Guard vessel performed dangerously close maneuvers next to the Filipino ship. This is not safe. But that's fine, because the Philippines is starting war drills with the U.S. Thousands of American and Filipino forces began on Monday one of their largest combat exercises in years. It will include live fire maneuvers, aircraft assaults, urban warfare, and beach landings in a showcase of U.S. firepower in the northern Philippines near its sea border with Taiwan. In light of the volatile, uncertain, and ambiguous nature of the security setting that we are faced and the fast-changing advancements in warfare, it has indeed been a shared responsibility to address our vulnerabilities and ensure that both our armed forces are able to promptly and effectively respond to any crisis or emergency under all circumstances. Which sounds to me like everyone in the region is making preparations for China attempting to invade Taiwan. There's even been talk in Japan 
of hosting U.S. nuclear weapons, which is making China nervous, but also makes me a bit nervous. We're going to give nukes to the only country we've ever nuked? That'd be like stabbing someone, then later asking them if they could hold your knife while you turn your back and tie your shoes. I sure hope Japan doesn't hold grudges the way I do. And after the break, they're going after Keanu. Welcome back. An update to last week's story about a mysterious plane crash in China. Investigators have recovered 36,000 fragments from the wreckage. Decoding work on the aircraft's two black boxes is underway in Beijing. The flight data recorder, which was buried about 40 meters from the main crash site, was unearthed on Sunday. As of this recording, there's no updates to what caused the plane to take a near vertical nosedive into the ground. Whatever caused this plane crash, one thing is for certain. There is going to be plenty of crazy conspiracy theories about it. And a lot of them are going to come from the Chinese Communist Party. Did you know the airplane's black box was created by the U.S. in a lab in Fort Detrick? China has declared genetic data a national resource. The move will strengthen the state's control over China's gene banks and other stores of genetic information. This is concerning for many reasons. One reason is, a lot of this genetic information is not being obtained with consent. The Chinese Communist Party looks at consent the same way I look at vegetables. It's important, but ignored. China is harvesting DNA from millions of people who are ethnic minorities. And a common Chinese-made pregnancy test from BGI Group has been harvesting gene data from millions of women around the world. Chinese authorities also collected blood samples from men across China to create a genetic map of the entire country's male population. So, what are they doing with these DNA databases? Chinese propaganda is turning up on U.S. social media. According to a new report by the Associated Press, China is using TikTok, Facebook, and YouTube influencers to parrot Chinese communist propaganda on everything from human rights abuses to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Because the best way to spread propaganda is through children dancing. War crimes? What war crimes? Watch me Cabbage Patch. The AP identified dozens of these accounts, which collectively have amassed more than 10 million followers and subscribers. Many of the profiles belong to Chinese state media reporters who have, in recent months, transformed their Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube accounts, platforms that are largely blocked in China, and begun identifying as bloggers, influencers, or nondescript journalists. Nearly all of them were running Facebook ads. Which is funny, because people were noticing that Facebook ads for Shen Yun, the performing arts company that bills itself as China before communism, couldn't be shared. Facebook now says it was a bug, which is the most blatant lie I've seen someone share on Facebook since literally any other time I've been on Facebook. Meanwhile, YouTube just demonetized our recent episode about the Uyghurs, the people the Chinese Communist Party is currently genociding. You've heard how they're taking Uyghurs and locking them up in concentration camps. Our demonetized episode is about how the Communist Party takes the children of these locked up Uyghurs and they put them in boarding schools where they brainwash them about how great the Communist Party is. YouTube said we were promoting hate or harassment towards individuals or groups. This was supposedly reviewed by an actual human being at YouTube. Yep, by criticizing the Chinese regime's hate and harassment towards individuals and groups, we were apparently promoting hate and harassment towards individuals and groups. Social media sucks. So do tech companies. Many U.S. tech companies are hopelessly dependent on China, and Apple is one of the worst. According to this new report, 18% of Apple's revenue came from China, and 85% of the company's products are assembled in China. But it's not just Apple. Tesla gets about a quarter of its revenue and does about the same percentage of its manufacturing in China. The NBA is also craven in its dependence on China. After spending years apologizing to China for the general manager of one team supporting the 2019 Hong Kong protests, the Chinese regime has finally allowed the NBA back on Chinese television. See, there are happy endings in life, assuming you're not from Hong Kong, or Taiwan, or an orphan child of persecuted Uyghurs. But hey, at least the NBA is back on Chinese TV. That's the important thing. 
And speaking of living happily ever after, China's demographic crisis is leading to talk of lowering the legal marriage age. China's marriage rate plunged last year to just 7.63 million, the fewest since records began 36 years ago. China's legal marriage age is the oldest in the world. Men can get married at 22 and women can wed at 20. But somehow, I don't think lowering the age is going to make more people want to get married. Although, depending on how low they make the legal marriage age, China may soon become an attractive new home for R. Kelly after he gets out of prison. And finally, China has banned Keanu Reeves' movies. Streaming services in China have quietly removed his movies, for what we can only assume is his support of Tibet. It happened after news that Keanu Reeves would be performing at a benefit concert for Tibet House back in March. Now I know what you're thinking. China banned Keanu? That means more Keanu for us! But that's not how it works. Keanu isn't a finite resource. Keanu is like a candle flame. His light can be shared infinitely and brightens the life of everyone he touches. Depriving the Chinese people of Keanu, well, it's time the Chinese Communist Party has gone too far. And this show would not be possible without support from viewers like you. So it's time for me to answer a question from one of you. Da Hoover asks on Locals, Can you all recommend good China Watcher groups I can involve myself in? I want to learn as much about China as I can. Well, Da Hoover, that's a great thing. I might recommend to you the Sinocism newsletter by Bill Bishop. He's been a China watcher for years and puts together a pretty good newsletter with a bunch of the latest China news, plus his analysis. It helps provide bigger context to individual stories. That'd be a good place to start. Thanks for your question and your support, Da Hoover. And if you'd like to support China Uncensored, join our exclusive social media platform on Locals. It's free to join, but paying supporters will get access to exclusive content and the ability to make posts and chat with Matt, Shelley, and myself. Check it out at chinancensored.locals.com. Or you can purchase this lovely t-shirt. I turned a blind eye to ethnic cleansing in China and all I got was this slightly cheaper t-shirt. Check that out and our other merchandise at chinancensored.tv slash merchandise. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.